All right, my, my cell phone says 1159, but my computer rolled over to noon, so I went ahead and started the recording, Dr. Hennigan. Okay, and my computer says 1203. Oh, so. my goodness. All right, well, a little <laughs> different from here to there. We are somewhere in the middle. I see people logging in. Happy Friday the 13th to everybody. Can you guys hear me because I can't hear you? Yes. Can yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, now I can hear you. Yes. I want to give some of the committee members another minute to show up. I know that we have a few that will be out, but I want to be conscious of everyone's time. There you are. Hey, Lynette. Hey, Dr. Files. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I think I see Carrie, too. <laughs> <laughs> there. Hi, Dr. Faust. It's nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Okay, I am going to go ahead and get started. I have 12.05 by my clock. And I will start with roll call. Um, Angela Gamboa. Carly Fleach. I know that Mr. Carnahan will be out, uh, Dr. Fowles. I'm here. Good to see you. Good to see you. I know uh, Elizabeth is out. Carrie Steving. Good afternoon. I'm here. Good afternoon. Kathy Busby. Monica Curry. I know Dr. Wilson. Is out. Vista Thompson. I'm here. Good to see you. Nice to see you. And Nicole Porter. Okay. Um, our first item on the agenda, um, I think we discussed it in January. We do have the community brochure ready, um, and it came as a recommendation from this group. So I want to hear from the group. We're ready to um, disseminate it. We do have it posted on our website. Um, we, it's, I'm getting kind of going to do two and one. It is part of our mental health awareness campaign. We'll have it posted and tweeted out. But other areas that the committee thinks or recommends that we touch the the original goal. When I look back at the notes, the brochure was to was created to hit rural areas. And those areas that did not have access to the internet. So we're touching the internet side of things and the social media side, but how do we get it out to those areas that may not have access to the internet um, or are out in rural areas? Any recommendations from the committee? I can think of one idea. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, a personal friend who does a lot of the community awareness for um, NACHI, which is Native American Health Services. I, I'm not going to have get the exact acronym right, but mm -hmm. they have an amazingly robust newsletter and communication system. And I'd be happy to put you in touch with her offline. I think it's something that they would. Um, you know, they have a lot of community activities for exactly that reason. And I think that would, mm -hmm. they would be a, a good resource. I would love that. Thank you. And we can s spread that out to her. Thank you for that. And this 
is Carrie. I, um, I have a couple recommendations. I think one is that we can request from um, the Arizona Council to disseminate to all of our providers that are a part of that and ask them to share with their members. And um, I think we can also, uh, I, we, all of the ACC Children's System of Care folks work together and the Adult Systems of Care. I can send them to all of our, my counterparts at the other health plans. Um, just so that they're aware and can, you know, identify folks that they, they can share it with. And then I think our family runs, Family Involvement Center, My Kid Reach, Raise and Special Kids, that I think they would be great access points to get it to families. And I don't mind um, taking that on. I can send that out to them and, you know, and, and ask folks to either, you know, uh, maybe have it, whatever's most appropriate for them, maybe have the copies in their lobby, um, if appropriate, maybe post in their lobby, or just share with staff and, and utilize as an educational tool. I think there's a couple of different things. And then just one other idea is that we can also look at where it might be appropriate to put in our resource material. Like I know that um, our, our website has, you know, different resources that we note for families and, you know, for members. And I think that it's a, it's a great uh, resource for folks to be, um, to learn more about what it is and, and how they can apply it and what they would need to know. So that's kind of off the top of my head. That is awesome. Do you have a copy of the brochure? Do you want me to resend it to you? Um, some of the ones that you're going to contact. Sure I do, but I'll let you. Yeah, if you'll resend it to me, and like I said, and I'm happy to. Um, actually, I think I saw uh, Candy Espino. I see that you're on here. I can follow up with Arizona Council afterwards, if that's mm -hmm. okay, and make that request as well. So I can take on some of those and, and ask folks to help get the information out there if that's appropriate. Perfect. What I will do actually is I will, after the meeting, resend the brochure back out to the entire committee so you guys have it at the forefront of your email. I know how things right. get buried very quickly, so I will make sure you guys have that. Thank you. Um, I love all those suggestions, Carrie. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Yeah, those are great ones. I, I, I think those are really good ones, Carrie and Vistin. And one, um, so would that include the non Medicaid plans as well, like Cigna, for example? Yeah, you know, is, is there some way we can reach them no. too? I mean, some of the non-Medicaid and even Medicare Advantage plans. Yeah. You know, Rogers Rogers often attends this, and I, I know he'd be. I think he'd be very open to that and willing. And but I think the others would be as well. I definitely can touch base with him, um, and we yeah. can find contacts for the other plans and push it out to them as well. You know, I know that there's a. Uh, so you know this better than I, but there's a shared lobbyist through Marcus Osborne. I, I mean. So something like that that can reach, you know, all, all the other plans as well. Okay. Right. Dr. Fowles, is the Arizona Alliance of Health Plans, would they, are all of them connected through that? Is that an opportunity maybe? You're talking about AHIS, America's Health Insurance Plan? Oh, you no, know, the Arizona. Right. Sorry, the yeah, Arizona no, Health Plan Alliance. Is. You're talking about the organization for the Medicaid plans. I think that that's. Oh, is it Medicaid only? Okay. I, yeah. I'm not that savvy with that. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, there's, there are a couple. There's the one with the seven plans, and then there's the, then the, the ones that the non Medicaid plans. Mm -hmm. Marcus tends to represent them as well. M Marcus represents oh. AHIP, which is the trade association for um, a lot of the plans. Not all plans are members um, of, of AHIP. Um, and I think he also does lobbying for, um, you know, other individual plans as well, including, including ours, even though we're not a hip members. Okay. The, I, I guess one, I just 1 question. Do you have like an accumulate? You know, do you have boxes of these things or you have sort of 1 online and you're looking for assistance to, like, replicate them and get them out? I guess. I, important so, yes. Way. We don't have boxes. We it's online. It's a downloadable um, PDF. So if they if they do have access to the internet, they can go to our website and download it. Um, we are going to be, like I said, kind of tweeting it out to point there to for our mental health awareness campaign. 
but we can I can email it to you and then if you forward it to them if whoever they feel needs it they can print it out so um, but we don't have boxes that we're just shipping out <laughs> right I was just thinking about libraries I mean libraries have become a lot like community centers and there's mm -hmm. a lot of useful and that's where people kind of go to see the internet you know to access the internet if they don't have it at home um but I was thinking more of you know stacks of brochures that people could pick up um but, but if you don't have you know, an accumulation of them, that's not real helpful. So. No, but this, so that's a, that's a wonderful suggestion because, you know, we were really, when we, when the idea for this originally uh, uh, came alive, it was really to try to get information like this out into the rural communities. Mm -hmm. And I think libraries might be a good resource for that, um, but we don't have a budget to print them. Um, so we would be relying on others to help us, uh, you know, make this available in print to other organizations or find organizations who would be willing to print it and supply it um, with an emphasis on, well, Arizona. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of the libraries. I'm not sure how we, is there an association of libraries we can reach out to? <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if there's some, you know, central organization of libraries and, or, you know, is it? A purely local thing. I just don't know. Um, I do think yeah. there is an association. I think so. Libraries. I think they may have weighed in on some bills of the legislature in the past um, relating to the state library. Um, so, no, I do think that there is an organization. I don't know them, but <laughs> I think there is. I can look that up too. And if there is, I can try to track down the contact and we can email it to them and kind of coordinate with them to see if they'd be willing to print it for their lobby. So I like that idea too with libraries. Yeah, that is a really good one. I, I think mm -hmm. that's good. What do you think about um, member associations like NAMI or, you know, the Mental Health Association, if, you mm -hmm. know, to the extent they orient into the rural and frontier areas? Yep. There's also a, a rural health um, Kind of community through the University of Arizona that might be interested That's in helping idea. with that. The um, Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association could potentially help too because they have a lot of rural members. Okay. We also have a distribution list for all the licensed rural health clinics that may, might be able to post things in their lobbies. Is, that would is be Jasmine, awesome. Is Jasmine Snipes on? Because I would like to hear from her how we can reach some of the. Um, you know, harder to reach communities. So, um, Jasmine uh, resigned from the committee last year. Um, and so, uh, Nicole is our new member that took her place. But I did reach out to Jasmine and she didn't have any further suggestions, which is why I'm bringing it back to the committee. So, Oh, that, is that distribution list something you can share or is it something I need to send the? No, I can send it to you. you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. <clears throat> Any other suggestions? This is plentiful. I love it. <laughs> Any more? Okay. Um, then. Next topic is May is Mental Health Awareness Month. I'm sure everyone on here is aware of that. And if not, it is. Um, <laughs> we are running our campaign again this year on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, so if you are on any of those vehicles and you see something tweeted from DiFi in regards to mental health awareness, we ask that you retweet us or like us, share it, um, and you'll see the brochure link posted in some of the upcoming posts over the next uh, few weeks. Any questions about that? Okay. Next, I think we have program updates from ADHS. I see that Jessica and Josh are on. They are um, standing in with Jacqueline. And so I don't know who, which one of the three of you wants to take the reins from here, or if all three of you want to jump in, um, but yeah, they're going to talk I'm, about the, hi. They're going to talk about the suicide mortality review program. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see everyone again. It's been a while since we've provided an update, 
And I just had a couple quick comments before I introduce Joshua and Jessica to the group. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about the uh, community brochure, um, we are in the process, and Joshua will probably talk a little more in depth about this, but we're in the process of establishing the state, uh, a statewide website for suicide prevention and mental health uh, resources uh, at ADHS. So the uh, suicide prevention program that was previously located at ACCESS uh, has transitioned over to the Arizona Department of Health Services and is in our Office of Injury and Violence Prevention. So we've been working on uh, establishing the website, uh, getting resources and all kinds of information, and it's uh, nearly complete. So I'm not sure, you know, we could uh, possibly put a link on our website uh, to the community brochure. And also we work with all the county health departments across the state. So that might be another avenue to uh, get the brochures out uh, because we work with the rural community uh, health departments. We are working on the suicide uh, mortality review uh, program, getting the uh, local jurisdictions uh, set up with suicide mortality review programs, um, especially in the rural areas. So just a thought. Um, if you would like to, you know, uh, I'm sure Joshua could circle back with you and um, get the links for the brochures uh, for our website. So, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Yes, yes, and yes, and yes. Yeah, so, I know. I was you. thinking about, I thought that's a great opportunity because it's good. It's, we want to be like the hub for the state so that people can come to our website and get all kinds of resources. Uh, for suicide prevention, mental health resources, and so on. So that that would probably be a great fit. And um, the other piece I was going to mention, and maybe while Jessica and Joshua are talking, we are also, um, in addition to the suicide mortality review program, which since I've last spoke to all of you, we've made great progress. Uh, Jessica Bell has... Um, created all kinds of uh, training program manual, and uh, we have been working with all the county health doc departments across the state and held uh, five training sessions now, so we're well on our way. But uh, we are also, as I mentioned before, launching a suicide prevention program at the Department of Health Services and working on an, a, a statewide suicide prevention action plan. And we will need, um, you know, interested stakeholders, external stakeholders. We're getting ready to have an external stakeholder meeting. So uh, while Jessica and Joshua are presenting more detailed information about these programs, if you would like to put your name in the chat, if you're interested in participating in the external stakeholder meeting when we roll out our uh, state suicide prevention action plan, to our partners to get feedback on that, please just enter your name in the chat and then we will make sure to add you to that list. So with that, I'm gonna say uh, Jessica Bell, I think I had uh, just recently, Jessica had joined ADHS when I met with you folks uh, previously. Jessica came from the Arizona Board of Pharmacy. So we had worked uh, together on the opioid overdose prevention program. And Jessica is uh, leading the suicide mortality review program for the state and has done a fantastic job. She is also supervising the uh, state suicide prevention program at ADHS. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica. She can talk a little bit more in detail about the work she's done on the suicide mortality review program and um, the counties that have already um, told us that they will be doing their review of suicides in their local communities. Um, so with that, I'll pass it off, Jessica. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the work that's been ongoing with the suicide mortality review team. Uh, this was also initiated as part of Jake's law. So it um, began, as Jackie said, I was hired in just under a year ago, and I was tasked with building the program from the ground up. 
And luckily we have a fantastic opioid overdose fatality review team that's already in place. And they were really able to help provide some guidance and support as I was beginning. And so, as Jackie mentioned, I initially started by creating the document that outlined the policies and procedures for how to collect and report the suicide related data, and then all of the templates that could be adapted by each of the local health departments to meet their local jurisdictions needs. And then after all of those were provided, we held a set of five separate trainings, as Jackie mentioned, to cover all of those policies and procedures that were contained, excuse me, within the guidance document. And I have recently begun meeting with the county health departments one on one to address any of the challenges that they may be having and to provide any technical assistance. And we currently uh, we're very excited. We have 11 counties that are planning to start this year. So they'll be looking at the 2021 um, death data. And that includes Maricopa County, which has a bulk of the suicide deaths in the state. So this will be, um, this is often a big lift for the fatality review teams to focus on Maricopa County because of um, the levels of uh, death that they have. And this will leave the state team to review the cases from some of the smaller counties that can't currently support a team. And we're hoping that we can eventually bring everyone on, um, but we know that resources are, are limited in some of those um, communities. So I will start attending meetings. We have one team that has already began their review session. They've already conducted um, one for their first quarter. And we have three more counties that are preparing to hold their orientation meetings within the next month. So I will be attending those meetings as the counties begin their work to help provide some support um, as needed. And then our attention will be focused on establishing and convening the state team to review uh, the remaining cases that aren't reviewed. And right now that's a pretty small number. So that's um, that's great news for us. And then once all of the teams have completed and submitted their review of the 2021 cases, the state team will compile all of the data and provide an analysis and final suicide prevention recommendations. And having the suicide prevention program come over to ADHS, um, this is kind of a, will allow for a synergistic effect with um, being able to look at the recommendations from the suicide mortality reviews to also inform um, the direction that we take as a state. And um, that summarizes my um, progress so far. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah, so let me introduce Joshua Stegemeyer. Um, as Jessica mentioned, she came on about a year ago. And then we were so fortunate to have Joshua Stegemeyer join the Department of Health Services in January of this year. So we just had the transition of the suicide prevention program from access to ADHS in the fall of last year, got, um, got Joshua onboarded in January of this year, and he has hit the ground running. He has been working uh, just very hard around the clock on getting the suicide prevention program uh, the action plan in place and and trying to meet others and learn more about what's going on in Arizona across the state for suicide prevention and mental health um, resources. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Joshua uh, Stegemeyer. And Joshua is a 12 year veteran, so he comes with some uh, particular experience um, having worked as a veteran uh, for many years and, and has an interest in um, working on uh, veteran suicide prevention. So Joshua, take it away. All right, uh, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, my name is Joshua Stegemeyer and I'm gonna talk about three things today very quickly. Uh, the program transition, the uh, prevention action plan, and then the website. Um, some of those things Jackie already alluded to, uh, but I'll go into a little bit more detail here. Um, real briefly, the program came over at the tail end of 2021, uh, like Jackie says. I wanted to highlight, though, that no personnel retained in that transition. Um, and so there was a partial record of activities and initiatives that have been going on at Access, but we really didn't have a, a complete visibility on what the, the program was, um, you know, with Access. So we've got new staffing 
And uh, uh, it's a great time to be lifting this off the ground, to be quite honest, at the tail end of the pandemic. So uh, we're, we're very excited to get started. But I just really wanted to highlight the, uh, uh, the new staffing, the partial record, and the, uh, be, and the late move towards the end of last year. Those are going to come into play um, here as I talk about the plan. Um, this is a new plan for a new program and a new department. Um, and this state action plan that we're lifting off the ground, it's a little bit different than previous action plans. Uh, the recommendations from places like SPRC are to go with a three to five year plan. But our plan this year is focused uh, uh, on a one year plan. It's going to run from 1 July of 2022 to 30 June of 2023. Uh, and this is going to do a couple of things for us. One, it's going to line us up with fiscal year planning, which is going to be helpful. Um, but it's also going to allow us to create a foundation uh, for a larger, more ambitious plan that we're going to uh, anticipate for 2023 to 2025. Um, so this one year plan is you know, focused a lot on our internal capability because we're a new program. We don't have the relationships established uh, uh, that we'd like to have to lift larger initiatives off the ground. And we, we simply don't know the landscape well enough to uh, uh, have more large scale, dramatic, impactful initiatives like hopefully we're going to uh, uh, plan for in our next plan. So the relationships have been reset. We have to reestablish in several critical areas such as our priority populations. For instance, uh, last year, ADHS lost the tribal liaison of 27 years to retirement. Great for them, but uh, leaving us without a, value a valuable resource. We have a new tribal liaison, but it's going to take them a few moments to get off the ground and then in turn to be able to help us get off the ground. So we have some several relational issues that are, are keeping us uh, somewhat more limited this year. And we also have um, kind of an externally imposed deadline for when we can get this plan off the ground. We're looking at getting it finalized and authorized uh, next month. And the reason for that is uh, access uh, has been awarded the 988 grant uh, for the crisis centers, but part of their grant award has been that it has to be nested within the approved state action plan within 60 days of award. Well, they were awarded that grant on the 15th of April, which means we've got, you know, uh, until June to kind of get our plan in line. So if you combine the uh, uh, the reset of the relationships with the externally imposed deadline, you can kind of understand why our, our action plan is going to be a little bit more limited. Um, but with that being said, we are quite proud of our plan, and there are several things in it that I wanted to highlight. Uh, one is that there are supportive interventions for identified priority populations. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag here, but we do have six identified populations. Uh, we have uh, interventions in place for uh, crisis and general prevention initiatives. We have two advertising campaigns, one for sure that we're going to be rolling out with 988 and one proposed. Um, we also have a heavy focus on partnerships. We've already identified the lack of partnerships, so we're going to be focusing on uh, getting those uh, relationships reestablished over the next year. We're also going to be bringing in some state level programming uh, for postvention. We really want to be able to get that not just into the public schools where they're at right now, uh, but across Arizona in things like uh, at-risk occupations, you know, things like the construction industry, the agricultural industry. Um, we're also going to be looking at tailoring some of these uh, uh, postvention and other resource packages for stakeholders based on some of the work groups we're going to be starting up. So while this plan is a little bit more limited than, than maybe the last plan or, or where we'd like to be in a couple of years, we feel like it's uh, uh, pretty much all we can handle over the next year. And we've uh, loaded ourselves up quite nicely. So uh, switching gears a little bit, one of the things that we felt was a major priority was transitioning the prevention website from access to ADHS's domain. Um, we are in the final steps of that right now. We're just waiting on some uh, a little bit of feedback um, from some key folks in our organization to be able to get this approved. Um, but it's in the very final stages, probably within the next month it'll be launched. Uh, some of the things that you'll be able to find on this website uh, that we're very proud of are specific priority population information and resources. These are really uh, tailored um, to be of value and to wherever possible insert local and uh, state resources 
um, and only having national resources available where they're filling in a gap that we don't have at our state level. Uh, we're also going to include general resources of uh, several types. One such uh, is uh, 12 step and peer support meeting finders. Uh, those are going to be valuable uh, as we look to restart peer support after a couple of years of not being able to meet in person. Things like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, uh, faith based groups, but also groups like uh, survivors of suicide and survivors of suicide loss. Um, we also have community mental health clinics with sliding scales. There's a resource list of those available on the website. Uh, we have local and national resources such as Robbie's Hope, Trevor's Project, the Southern Arizona Gender Alliance, county and state crisis warm lines, many different tribal resources. We're, we're really looking to be a um, kind of a clearinghouse for all the valuable um, partners that we have statewide. You can come to our website and find all that information. Another thing that we are uh, loading up on the website is a data dashboard. Now it's currently fully functional, uh, accessing some of our databases. Um, and if you're curious as to which data they are accessing, um, Jessica, or we can put you in charge with our um, epidemiologist, Mercer, that would be able to answer those questions more in depth than I can. Uh, but the data dashboard is going to improve in functionality even beyond where it's at. We want to add the ability to sort data by additional fields and some other improvements. So that's going to be a, a real asset for transparent data in the state when you can come here and get that. We're going to have an event calendar for advertising grassroots events and trainings and presentations across the street, uh, state. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about was a graphic resource map of Arizona. So it goes by county. You can click on the county and you can find resources for that particular county. So those are some of the things that are going to be um, coming out on the website. Uh, some of the things that will be coming out through the state action plan, which will hopefully be coming live uh, here in the next month or so. Uh, and a little bit about the program transition. So that's all I was going to talk about. I'll bounce it back to Jackie. Yeah, thank you everyone for um, inviting us to attend the meeting and share this information. Do you have any questions for any of us? It is a Friday afternoon, so it's pretty quiet. <laughs> it is Friday. <laughs> it is Friday. Um, maybe Jackie, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. This is Erin. Um, I don't have my camera on again, but uh, I just wanted to ask you, Jackie, uh, uh, at the outset of your comments, you you mentioned the possibility of posting the consumer brochure on the new uh, website that Josh was just uh, espousing, and I was wondering if you could, what do you need from us besides, uh, you know, the the link uh, in order to, to to do something like that? Um, do, well, I'm assuming on your website, uh, and I know I had looked at this previously, but you have a summary or so of what the uh, brochure is about uh, for our, you know, for our website, so we can have some kind of um, section there and, and um, explanation as to the purpose and the mission of the, you know, um, DIFI or the program yeah. that, yeah, the information surrounding the brochure. Okay. Um, I, I sent a link to the I put a link to the a direct link to the brochure in the chat for everyone. By okay. the way, but um, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. The on our website, it's just referred to as a community brochure, so we don't really have anything that describes it. Um, but okay. we could certainly email you uh, a couple of sentences uh, if that would be helpful. Yeah, I think that would be great. I think that would be great, okay. and. Um, and again, uh, you know, the suicide mortality review program, as Jessica was um, talking about that, we have been meeting on a regular basis with all the county health departments. So, again, mm -hmm. if you would like, we could uh, make this information aware, you know, bring that to their attention and put it in the presentation when we meet with them next. So, uh, they will be aware of this and maybe post it on their websites as well. So, the more we can get it out there for you, the better. That would be phenomenal. We'd really appreciate that. It's, you know, it, it really is a handy, short uh, <laughs> two page tutorial on Mapia and basically just wetting people's appetite to try to learn more and giving them some resources and um, telling them about the department. So 
um, hopefully that's something that folks would be able to help us disseminate. Thank you. Sure. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? I was going to say, um, maybe Jessica mentioned this when she was um, speaking, she had a lot of information. So <laughs> um, I, I was just curious now that you're kind of get, getting things rolling and you'll be working on 2021. I don't know how long it takes for these reports to be aggregated. And I also can't remember if the legislation said whether or not there would be a publicly available report, but I guess I'm just sort of curious, um, you know, I sit on the board for Mental Health America of Arizona. Um, and so with an eye toward future potential policy changes when we might be able to have an idea of when there would be information available that we that might inform you know future change right so the death data lags behind by six months or so so as jessica mentioned uh the teams will start reviewing the 21 2021 uh death data and we are under the statute for the, it's ARS 36-199. We are mandated to conduct a statewide annual analysis of suicide in Arizona. So we have put together a very detailed, comprehensive uh, data collection tool so that the goal is um, we fund the different uh, county health departments and part of the reporting requirements is that they fill out the data from the suicide reviews that they conduct in their area and they will be submitting data to us in addition the state suicide mortality review team we will be reviewing <clears throat> Um, suicides from different counties that um, do not have the bandwidth or the capacity to establish their own suicide uh, mortality review programs. So we'll be reviewing those and we too will be uh, collecting data from those reviews. And then at the end of, um, and, and it will not necessarily coincide with the fiscal year because the death data, it'll be more um, aligned with just the calendar year. Uh, but we will be completing an annual um, report, Compi you know, we'll compile the data, analyze the data, put together a report um, with the um, recommendations that come out of uh, the, the suicide reviews. So we do the same thing with our drug overdose fatality review. We collect data from all of the county health departments um, that conduct uh, overdose fatality reviews. And then our statewide team does a review and uh, we conduct the same type of thing, an annual analysis, and we post them on our website. So we will be doing that, Carly, um, and getting that out there and making it available to the public. So the goal of these reviews, obviously, and I think everyone in this group understands that, you use the uh, data that you collect and the information to inform your prevention recommendations um, at the local levels. And then uh, for the statewide analysis, we will be looking at how can we improve the system? What policies can be changed or improve um, to you know, reduce suicide in Arizona? Sure. Also, to, to answer your question about the timeline, it's a little bit for this 1st year. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell because the teams are kind of coming online at different times. And so there may need to be a little bit more time allotted for those um, teams to kind of be able to process their data and submit it. So um, this 1st year may be a little bit different and then there'll be a uh, you know standard cadence for that to, to be reported, but um, definitely want to know who is interested in that. As Jackie said, it will be a publicly available report on our website, but um, definitely can point your attention to it once it is completed um, so that, you know, you may help with that policy piece. Um, and then to, I guess to that point, I also don't recall what our um, uh, advisory committee, uh, like sunset, time frame is um i don't have the entire statute mem memorized but assuming we're still around and meeting at semi-regular intervals um is 
is that something that we can invite you back to kind of do um, a presentation about when there is some data to discuss? I was just going to suggest that because I think that would be uh, perfect for uh, Jessica to come back and, and present once the um, annual report is finalized. Yes. Perfect. I would definitely yeah. be interested. <laughs> Yeah. Um, would, would definitely invite other members of our board to be able to hear um, and honestly, just kind of make it more of a community forum, I think would be amazing. Just so we, um, so this information isn't just locked away in, in bureaucracy land, which, you know, you guys do amazing work, but I think a lot of times the public just is unaware. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be amazing. And I think that also goes to, to also, um, uh, Josh was, um, you know, action plan. I, I think I'd be in, interested to, to see some, some more about that when it's available. Well, um, <laughs> not to speak for Joshua, but, um, our goal, as Joshua mentioned earlier is to. Finalize and complete this uh, um, suicide action plan, um, prevention action plan by mid June. So maybe sometime in July would be a good time to come back and present that uh, because you can probably pull some slides from that um, and uh, review the finalized recommendations. Anything else for you? Jackie, Jessica, or Josh? You guys are like the three J's. No? Okay. Thank you for that update. It's been great. And just, Carly, for your, for a point of reference, they have a standing um, spot on our agenda. So. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Next item, I don't know if Ruth or Odette are here to talk about the hospital discharge rules at all. Um, I did not get comments. I am here, but I don't have any updates um, as far as the rules go that we probably need Ruth for this. Okay, and I don't see her on. So we'll I'll make sure to have an update for you at the next meeting. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Um, next update on the status of our rules and I will turn it over to Mary Kaczynski. Mary, are you there? Yes, I you earlier. Morgan, thank you. Um, uh, I think and uh, welcome to everybody. It's good to see you all again. It's been a while. Uh, so what I did since it's been a while, I did a little um, recap of where we are in the rulemaking process. So uh, last September, we received an exemption from the governor's uh, rules moratorium. As you know, the governor has a rules moratorium in place, so we need to get permission to run any rule uh, in the state. So that was granted by the governor's office uh, back in September of last year. Um, in November, we uh, exposed the draft rule and conducted uh, a listening session with the stakeholders and we accepted comments from them from no uh, until November 30th. So they had about 2 or 3 weeks to we expose the rule at the beginning of November. They had till the end of November to um, give us comments. Um, with those comments, we made some changes and then we submitted a proposed rulemaking to the Secretary of State for publication, which was published in January and that was published in early February. Um, once you publish a uh, proposed rule, it automatically starts a comment period. So that initiated a comment period, which lasted from February 4th through March 6th. Uh, we received 29 comments, uh, only one from an insurer, which um, was a little surprising to us, but um, I think the uh, listening sessions had been uh, pr productive uh, with the insurers, so um, they knew what was coming. Um, we got two rule change comments, which was one was to add a definition for medical necessity, and the other one was to pluralize 
the Exhibit A instructions. And um, we have just declined to do either of those. Uh, the reason that we did, did not add a definition for medical necessity is because uh, the department feels that um, that really should be defined in statute. It was not defined by the Arizona legislature or um, by um, the Department of Labor or the other federal agencies that um, uh, govern MAPIA. And so we were using a, we had put a, in, our, in one of our drafts, we put a definition from CMS, but, um, but that really wasn't appropriate. And we feel that we cannot, you know, really overstep our authority and put medical necessity in the rules. So we declined to do that. Um, and the other was to pluralize Exhibit A instructions. And we feel that because all the insurers are familiar with uh, the MAPIA, federal MAPIA statutes, that they should understand that uh, when we say we need um, any, any um, information, it has to be all the information they have, just not singularly. So we're presuming that the insurers know that, so we don't believe that we need to make a change uh, to uh, the exhibit. Um, one of the overarching concerns for us is um, if we make substantive changes to a proposed rulemaking, we have to expose it again as a supplemental proposed rulemaking, which starts another 30 day comment period. So we felt that neither of these changes that were requested would, would um, if, if uh, were, were uh, consequential enough that we would want to restart the rulemaking process again. So we declined to do either of those um, substantive changes. Uh, the one insurer that did um, um, uh, comment was Medica, and they requested us to delay the rulemaking pending some anticipated federal changes that are coming down the pike this year. We also declined to do that because we feel that um, we're not sure when the federal changes will come. And we also can, you know, revise the rule in the future, depending on what the um, federal changes are that are initiated by the federal government. So we didn't think that it was enough to delay the, um, there was no reason for us to delay the rulemaking. We also didn't re any, get a request for any oral proceeding, which meant we could go forward with the final final rulemaking, because that would have also delayed things. Yeah, I have the next slide, Mary. So um, on April 6, 2022, we received permission from the governor's office to submit the final rulemaking to the Governor's Regulatory Review Council, or uh, also called GERC. Uh, and we submitted that to the, uh, to GERC on April 12, 2022, we wanted, we submitted it on that date, which was a week prior to the deadline, so that we could be placed on the May 24th study session and the June 1st council meeting, but uh, we have found out, unfortunately through a third party, that we will be placed on the June 28th study session and agenda, uh, agenda and on the July 6th um, council meeting agenda. Um, I did reach out to, to the GERC staff and ask why we'd been bumped. And they said, you know, uh, their, their docket was already too full and they couldn't, couldn't do anything, you know, add any more. So, um, uh, so they, they know that we're not happy about it, but we don't really have any way to, um, to make, force them to put it on the, agenda at the end of this month. So we're going to have to wait an extra month before we're before the council. Can I have the next slide, Mary? So uh, the path forward is if we are approved at the um, Burke July 6th council meeting, we can submit the notice of final rulemaking to the Secretary, Secretary of State for publication. Um, if we submit it by July 8th, which is a deadline you know, from the Secretary of State, it will be published um, July 29th in the Arizona Register. And the effective date is always 60 day, 
60 days after submission to the Secretary of State, not after publication. So if we were to submit it July 6th, it would be effective September 4th. If we submit it July 7th, it would be effective, effective September 5th. If we submit it July 8th, which would be the deadline for that publication, uh, it would be effective September 6th. So I'm hoping that um, you know, we need to get the director of the department to sign off on a certificate and we need FERC to, sub, um, to um, transmit to us a certificate of approval before we can submit. But both of those things I don't anticipate a delay on. So I'm hoping that we're looking at an early September effective date for our rules. That's it. Any questions? Mary, um, thank you for that. Am I correct then that what we saw published as proposed rules is what you filed with GERC? Yes. Okay. Because we did make a couple of changes. Um, there were some non substantive changes that we made. Um, the first non substantive change that we made was that there is an incorrect reference in Exhibit A to rule. Uh, to section R20 6-1303B when it should have been section R20 6-1302B. So we made that correction. And the other correction that we made was um, uh, according to rule writing standards, the citation to the Code of Federal Reg Regulations is merely supposed to be CFR. And we had put in C period F period, R period. So we corrected those citations to be compliant with rule writing standards. But those are the only changes that were made from the proposed rulemaking. Thank you. Mary, is it, um, I guess just for the, for the uh, committee benefit, the, the, these, these BERC meetings are public um, you, I don't know if we included on an earlier slide a link to the GERC website. We can put it in the chat if anybody's interested in um, listening in to the GERC study committee discussion. Um, and there is a, a means by which people can submit comments. Um, there's an online form. You have to request the opportunity to, to give comments. So I don't know if you want to speak to that, Mary. Um, yes, uh, we can we can um, send a link out to all the committee members prior to the prior to the GERC meeting. Uh, the other thing I did want to say real quickly is that when we submit the final uh, rulemaking to GERC, we also have to submit back all the comments we received to the committee so that they can uh, to the council so they can review them. There were six comments that we received that were generally supportive comments of the rulemaking, but had uh, personal identifying health information in them. So we redacted that uh, PHI before we sent it over to GERC because we can't, um, we can't mask the person's name because it's a public comment, but we can mask the personal health information. So we did redact that information before we sent it over to GERC because it's a public meeting and it can be, you know, exposed publicly. So, um, but we all sent all the, the whole, all the 29 comments we received over to them. So they have those to review. And they're on our website as well, on the department's yes. website as well. As are all of the comments that we received on the draft rule. Is the department confident in um, ultimate approval during this period? <laughs> Apparently that is a great question. <laughs> we are hopeful. We are not, um, uh, you know, we obviously appear before the council as um, a party and, um, you know, and they are, they're going to be taking questions of, you know, people who submit for comments may ask questions of the department, but, you know, it's really kind of an unpredictable process. Mm -hmm. You know, they may have concerns that, um, you know, they may bring up that, you know, we are available to answer, but it's really, 
Um, they're, they're a very diverse group and they ask a lot of really interesting questions. So uh, I'm presuming that we will not have any issues, but yeah, I just can't predict whether we will or not. I can't imagine we will, but I can't promise anything. Sure. Um, given the complexity of insurance issues in general, but you know, um, this particular issue as well. Um, I mean, in, in your experience going before GERC, how, how technical in nature do they get? Like, what kind of questions would you anticipate? You know, like I said, I, I don't, it depends on what their background is. You know, I don't know any, that any of them have any um, background in insurance. We just ran four rulemakings in front of them. One was credit for reinsurance. Another one was um, prepaid mm -hmm. dental plan organizations. Another was um, annuity disclosures. And the last one was military personnel. And they asked no questions about any of those. So, and those are all, you know, relatively complex, especially credit for reinsurance and annuity disclosures. But, you know, I, they asked no questions about any of those. So I have no idea. I, I, they may have some interest because obviously Jake's law piques interest, you know, for a number of people, you know, and I don't know what their personal backgrounds are, but we'll just have to wait and see. Curious to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious in a hopeful way. Good. <laughs> that makes me feel good. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you everyone. We'll just keep plugging away and we will make you aware of um, when the when the council meeting comes up, we will um, give you the contact information so that um, that you can join the meeting. Um, on Fort, and you can send information to the council members prior to the meeting if you'd like. Um, but but um, if you want to make a comment at the meeting, you have to sign up once the meeting starts. It's a, a little glitch they have in their process. So um, we can send information about that. It, it's in their agenda, but we'll send their agenda around before the, before the hearing. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, um, Mary B, can you go to the last slide? She's there. Oh, here we go. Um, so I wanted to, as we talk about the next meeting, um, which will be in July, um, there is there's a lot of stuff coming up with these um, digital platforms for behavioral health. We have like Talkspace and Cerebral and um, things like that. So I want to put it on your radar so we can discuss it maybe in July. I want to hear from the committee what you're seeing from an industry standpoint. Um, how do you think it may be impacting MAPIA um, with the different providers that are starting to provide services across the country um, on these platforms? Um, there's obviously privacy issues. There are licensing issues. There are different types of issues. In, if it's impacting MAPIA, how do we, as a committee, um, deal with that? Does it impact how we look at the rules? I think there's going to be a lot of discussion about this as we go forward because this type of platform is not going away. And so I just kind of wanted to share that um, link that Aaron shared with me so we can think about it for next meeting and how these these type of platforms, if they are impacting MAPIA, are, if you, like I said, if you guys from an industry standpoint are seeing it impact MAPIA and how we can navigate that world as it is here and it's not going away. So if you have any comments now, I'd, what you think, but just keep that on your radar for, for next meeting. And if you have any other topics that you would like us to put on the agenda for next meeting that you wanna share now, that would be great. If anyone has any, I don't have any, but on the, this topic, I mean, I personally have no experience using these apps. 
Um, you know, I see a therapist, but, um, you know, she's here in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I don't know. I, I just, I'm not very familiar with exactly how these work. Do these apps submit for even like insurance reimbursement? So it, it, it's across the board, Carly. So some are contracted with um, commercial, some are private pay. Um, again, you have, there's licensing concerns, which isn't necessarily in our realm. It's getting kind of the outer areas, but you know, if you have, if you if you live here, your counselor's in Colorado and they're not licensed here, they're licensed out of Colorado, what does that look like? And so there's just, I'm more curious because I, I also think as a provider as well, in this standpoint, like how does this impact services of the patient going forward? If there's a issue, um, how do you get the issue resolved? Is there, you know, if there is an issue with the, with the provider or with the platform itself? Um, so if I live in Colorado and I'm providing services to you here in Arizona, I may not be aware of the crisis line in Arizona. And if you tell me that you're suicidal, what, what, does, what does that mean? because I can't get you to the services because I don't know them because I live in Colorado. So I have all those far reaching questions, but I know that we want to kind of stick to how does that impact us as a committee with Jake's law and what's going on here in the state of Arizona. I guess maybe one of the questions would be like, how do these apps fit under the umbrella of telemedicine? Mm -hmm. um, and like in terms of whether or not provider via cerebral or whatever app um, would be. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, somebody I think had some feedback in the background. Um, but anyway, whether or not these are coverable even under insurance and, um, and how it fits under the medicine uh, laws that have been kind of loosened here. Mm -hmm. What type of app is it? There's a bunch. There's uh, a quite a few, yeah. <laughs> there's like oh, I know, there's a bazillion out there and they're all sorts sizes and shapes and do all sorts of different things. I'm just is there a particular thing with this particular app or is it... um this particular one they're having um it brings up the issue of privacy. So how they're mining um, privacy data and how they're sharing it because I don't think the laws have caught up with how, however they're using it. Um, it's, it's questionable. It's not, it's not protected. So, ah, okay. Yeah. That... Which, which is all, of course, another, another issue in itself, <laughs> but, um, you know, no, all this. Right. Go ahead, gonna, it might be interesting to have somebody from one of the licensing boards you know, that would regulate um, practice that's sort of outside the, the scope, you know, because they usually have rules, for example, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this, but if you're living in Colorado, but you're rendering services to an individual in Arizona, um, I think you need to be licensed um, for that purpose. So they may have run into situations, you know, where they've tried to engage in enforcement activities or to prevent some out of state person from, from doing that. But I, I agree with Carly. I think the, the intersection with telehealth is really important because um, I think there's a general consensus that, you know, it, and that's the way you cure um, and, and help have an adequate network. Uh, for your members is through use of telehealth providers, particularly in rural areas, um, but it, it does raise, you know, other issues. Um, so anyway, somebody from a licensing board might be a, a you know, helpful resource. Uh, Vista, for... Do you think that there's anybody on the industry side who may have some expertise here as well? Because I, you know, I mean, even if you think about the privacy concerns is that that's part of when you onboard um, uh, providers, right? Like you have to have certain measures in place to protect patient privacy or. Absolutely. I mean, if we were to, for example, retain a, a vendor, say a vendor that had, a, you know, a, a behavioral health network or a telehealth network, or maybe even some brick and mortar, 
um, you know, there would be a contract between us and that vendor and it would have a lot of protective information in it. You know, you'll abide by HIPAA. Um, you know, you will, you know, do all of these various things in, um, you know, in how you conduct your business. Um, you know, you'll comply with licensing laws. So we would regulate that and under probably accreditation standards under the contract, you know, we would main, it would be our responsibility to maintain oversight of that vendor to ensure that they're living up to the terms of their contract. Um, but it's, you know, for something like this, where it is sort of direct to consumer, um, you know, just like, for example, if you had a PPO plan and you had a covered benefit and you decide I'm going to go out to, you know, some vendor for a counseling visit, um, it's, you know, maybe the vendor would submit a claim for you or the, you would submit a claim on your own behalf. You know, and there would be requirements, for example, one of the requirements in our benefit plans is that it be what we would call an eligible provider. I would not be an eligible mental health provider. Um, you know, it's got to be somebody who's appropriately licensed. So, you know, when the claim came in, we would probably evaluate, is it an eligible provider, among other things? And then, you know, is it a covered service? Um, so it sounds like, you know, this may be more direct to consumer kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway. Yeah, and just to go back what you said, Vista, the I think it was Vista or Carly, the Air, the Association of Social Work Boards, um, they're trying to get legislation on the, you know, trying to get this compact or universal reciprocity right for social workers. Um, so the licensing is across the board. I know other boards are looking at some of the same things or interstate compact. So it might just be the Western region. So California, Arizona, Utah, Texas, we may all have a compact as a as a region. So all of our licensed social workers can have the same guidelines and be licensed or we get reciprocity in the states easily. So I could provide services in California and not have to get a California license because they recognize my Arizona uh, social work license. So those are some of the things I know at a national level that those discussions are happening to kind of get ahead of this, the whole telehealth thing because there is concern about place of service versus where the where the provider is. And so in that right. impact network. So when the pandemic first started, obviously a lot of providers moved to a virtual setting to protect both themselves and their patient or their clients. And so when I was having therapy sessions during that time, my provider had to ask every time, are you in the state of Arizona? So I'm just like, if we're really talking within the realm of MAPIA and like parsing it out in terms of telemedicine and insurance coverage, I'm, I just, I'm trying to understand how we, how we can conceptualize it within the the, the realm of, of what we're here for. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so it's something just to, like yeah. I said, to kind of roll it. Go ahead, Erin Reese. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lynette. Just, it was just something to kind of start thinking about if we, as the rules go into place here in, in Arizona and what, what we start seeing once we start getting reports and I'm reporting back, is that something we need to look out for? Are those blips going to show up? Is that going to, is it going to be something impactful? Um, and I don't know yet. This is, like I said, this is really at the, at the front part of this whole thing. So just something to think about. It's a good one because, you know, there can be differences between physical and behavioral health on this, on these issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, you know, one app may get paid for in the physical side, not in the behavioral health, even though they do similar things and vice versa. Yeah. So I, I, I'm glad you raised it. I am too. I mean, I'm like, I don't have an opinion really about these like channels for mm -hmm. services. I'm sort of net neutral. Um, I just, I, I guess maybe that's why I, <laughs> I would like to understand better how this 
may or may not translate into um, like a like a replacement for a traditional service. You know right. what I mean? I remember these these companies, some of them um, are by company brand, they are IT companies. And then they hire this platform for behavioral health or medical services. So the company then, itself is is a digital company on paper, which yeah. often changes they the nature. Advertise relentlessly on podcasts and on social media. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, and I'm sure it works for some people. I think I've just always had concerns about like the quality of provider you would get, and mm -hmm. so I've I've always trusted <laughs> the traditional approach um you know and i think in part too because our the insurers do their own type of vetting on the back side so right um, and of course i've always looked to make sure providers on both the medical and mental health side are um you know in good standing with their boards and blah 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 blah, blah. so it's just a, it's a strange it's a strange issue i know it's out there so, and yeah, I'd love to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Carly, I appreciate your, your, uh, I think we were having the same struggle here. It's, it's, it's a really, um, hot. <laughs> these things are cropping up like crazy and people are using them, um, to receive mental health services. And I'm not really sure what the nexus is between these, you know, I keep referring to them as kind of the the Uber of mental health services where you can just get it yourself. Um, but I don't know if any health plans are contracting with any of these platforms to, to as a delivery mechanism for uh, connecting people with providers. I, I don't know. Um, if they are, I would sure like to hear about that. And what are the pros and cons? And is it working or is it not working? Um, uh, you know, I mean, it is a form of telehealth. Uh, you're, you're getting services through an app over some IT platform. You're not seeing somebody in person. So, is there more? Is, is, there, is there opportunity there, or is it more, uh, you know, more more problematic? Um, so, I, I'm not sure that there's a nexus to insurance here. But if there is one, that's obviously what this group would want to explore. And, you know, what are the what are the considerations for the insurance uh, health health insurance? And and is there, well, this group isn't, you know, your your scope isn't really to um, to educate the public on these platforms or the pros and cons of these platforms. But if people are using them and they think that it's going to be covered by their insurance, and then it's not, uh, that might be something that the public would benefit from some education around. Again, I don't know that that's within the scope of this of this group, but. Um, mm -hmm. It's, well, they were just interesting topics that we were brainstorming. <laughs> and 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 absolutely. And I think even like beyond that, which is not so much the scope of of what this committee, but you know, if somebody has a bad experience with a provider through these apps, what kind of recourse do they have? <laughs> like, if if these are not licensed folks by the state of Arizona, then like, is there any recourse if something like really harmful is said in a session? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so yeah, like it's, it's sort of the wild west of. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, so there, there, again, this was food for thought. This may not really be something that the committee wants. To, to dive into, uh, uh, but but we we are we are hoping to kind of get some ideas from you about other topics that this since we have this um, brain trust here with a, with a diverse perspective, uh, we'd really like to to get some topics uh, for the committee to to discuss. No, and and I think I still think that this might be fine to discuss, but I think since we are clearly not experts. It may be like, can we invite insurers to discuss this issue? Can we invite um, licensing boards to discuss like the things that they 
have had to think about with regard to this, and then it may inform whether or not there is a parity related um, consideration. Cons yeah. yeah, exactly. I can tell you one of the issues that you face whenever you outsource something, you know, if we were to outsource a network, when you're doing your non quantitative treatment analysis of, you know, meds or how do you treat med surge and behavioral health, when you've outsourced all of those functions to another entity, you're comparing something that you don't, you know, it's, it's not. A, so if I delegated credentialing to another organization, my company has delegated it. Normally we'd have a credentials committee and it would be a, you know, a unified process for all providers who come into our network who pass through that process. But if I've delegated it out to another organization, my vendor, you know, behavioral health network, I'm trying to compare how they do it on their side with how I do it on my side. And it's not going to be identical. It's not going to be the same type of process. It just adds a lot of complexity to doing that non quantitative treatment analysis. Um, and, and I, it's a hard problem to solve for because you're hiring the vendor, you know, and taking advantage of their processes. Um, you know, and you, you put in criteria about kind of how they do stuff, but it's, it's not going to be like my credentials committee. So it's it just it's a hard problem to solve. You, you know, it, it's very it's a good discussion because I think it's, Lynn, I think it is good to have things like this come into the committee and talk about you know from a parity perspective because I think part of our, part of the challenge here in 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 the interest of trying to be fair with it you know, that there's a we deal with everyone fairly and pro and uh, properly is. You know, there are certain things in the behavioral health world that are, that are going to occur that don't occur in the medical and vice versa, and for some good reasons. And I think one of the one of the objectives for this group is to be able to ferret those out and say, okay, yeah, it is different. You know, medical is different from behavioral health, and on the surface, it seems like a parity violation, but it really isn't because there's some really good reasons. To do it this way, you know, whatever, whatever the specific might be. And I, I find it all the time, uh, you know, the, the provider and plan worlds can be so different. And the languages can be so different that some of this is just really clearly understanding what's going on in each world, each other's world. And more often than not, when that understanding occurs that the, the, you know, we realize, hey, there really is not a problem with parity. And, um, you know, so I, I mean, I even think when you get down to some of the authorization issues on the med surge side, there may be a practice where, you know, that they're using DRGs, uh, but in behavioral health, it's different because DRGs may not be used for particular non-medical behavioral health hospitals. And, um, you know, so there are gonna be different practices that apply. It's not a one size fits all by any stretch of the imagination. And honest to God, for some, there are a lot of good psych hospitals out there, but there's some that may not be so good where it really does warn an every three day authorization period. Because if you don't do that, then you you face runaway utilization costs, which is also not good for members and taxpayers and others. So I think I, you know, I uh, I just think in the spirit of, of is doing as the best job we can for our community and for each other that we, we owe it to ourselves to really bring these things up like this. Yeah, also. One of the other ways it would come in is it, it's what I was describing before. So if it is, you know, a, a payable claim and the member, so one of the things we say is if you go to an in-network provider, they're gonna submit your, their claims for you. If you go to an out-of-network provider, you know, they may or may not submit claims, um, but, if the member has to submit the claim and has to have the information necessary to, to validate the claim, um, and it is a payable claim, then cost share, cost share implications are gonna apply. And so a counseling visit with a licensed counselor done through one of these sort of direct to consumer virtual things ought to have the same you know, cost share, a parity based cost share applied to it. it may not be identical, but it has to meet those quantitative requirements. 
Right. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I mean, a, a related issue in this is, yeah, and you guys have already discussed it some, but, you know, you got a bunch of these things out there. Some are good, some are not so good. And so, you know, someone could argue from a parity perspective, well, they have access to all these things on the med search side. Why not on behavioral health? Well, part of the problem is in behavioral health, it may not be in the member's best interest to be going to someone who's really not qualified to be doing the work that they're doing. And it's really, a, and you know, just in, in, our, in this day and time, there's an awful lot of money in healthcare right now looking for places to land. And uh, some, you know, it, it's not always the best thing where it lands. And so I think it, it's good to be mindful of these things and to be discussing them. And, you know, we might be able to, you know, help help out quite a bit here. I agree. Another, Another go ahead. I was just going to say that's that's popped up on some things I've had to look at, um, and it goes back to your point about the compact. Um, I think I've looked at our behavioral health licensing rules before, and they are very complicated. Oh. It seems like there are so many gradations in <laughs> practitioner type. Um, and so the, the premise of a compact is usually that, um, you know, if you meet the same or similar standards in your other state, you know, when you, you register here and you do certain things, then you get, you know, you have compact rights to treat members here without being right. fully licensed. I think it would be far more difficult in the behavioral health world to compare from state to state, apples to apples. Um, just Amen. because of the, yeah, the variety. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can definitely understand and sympathize with that. Um, but I can also say that, you know, we still have on the behavioral health side a shortage of of providers and I cannot tell you how many times I hear people t tell me that they have had to wait, you know, six plus months to to get in with a provider. So, like the balance between <laughs> making sure people have services and um, obviously people being qualified, you know, you would think maybe the ability to go across state lines or whatever would help alleviate some of that. Maybe not, but, um, I, I, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a complicated problem that I don't know what the solution is, but I just, I, it breaks my heart every time, especially for the mothers I know who have children in really difficult circumstances and they're waiting six months. I, I have a friend who told me, you know, <laughs> She found out about some abuse that happened and, you know, trying to get that child to be with a qualified professional to work through some of that trauma took over six months. And that's just a real, real tragedy. Yeah. It, you know, Carly, it's, um, I mean, it's a parity related issue and I'll just, I'll, I'll just take the example of psychiatry right now. So there's a, a huge workforce shortage. It's tough to get to see a psychiatrist. And if you're, and if you don't have Medicaid, it's really tough. But here's, so it's, on the surface, it seems like a parity violation. But when you dig a little deeper, so in the public sector, there, there are psychiatrists and nurse practitioners who are seeing patients and everything. But then the system is bifurcated with, with people who are not in the public system on the psychiatry side who are charging, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars an hour. And and so is is the insurer or is anyone really expecting us as a community to support that type of hourly rate? I don't think so. It's it's so now there are people with who are willing to pay cash to do that, but because of the shortage, our our system sort of been bifurcated into those who get paid a lot of money, and and those who are in the public system who who get paid a lot less, but are you know. It does it. So I think um, it's not just a simple thing of, you know, it's a parity issue because there's not access to psychiatrists. It's like, well, what are they asking to be paid? 
that that is really what's created some of some of the shortage here. So you basically wipe out a whole part of the uh, network just by virtue of guys charging seventy hundred bucks an hour. So I think that's an issue yeah. that we're going to have to figure out. I mean, and truly, Doctor Powell's, I I don't know what the solution is, but I know that like the two moms who have told me about their recent experiences. They ultimately did not go through their insurance and they still had these enormous wait times. So not only are they not getting the benefit of the insurance that either they're, their employer is paying for um, because the waits are so long, um, but now they're paying completely out of pocket for the services. And I have friends who are licensed therapists they refused to work with the insurance companies just because it is such a Byzantine um, effort and system to try to get reimbursement. I mean, one of my best friends is a therapist and she's just like calls, texts me constantly about the problems she has and having to spend hours on the phone trying to get claims processed. So, I mean, it's just everything is not conducive to people getting the services that they need. And it is definitely multi-factored. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's definitely a, a unfortunate or weird time because I think I, my colleagues that are, are still treating people, um, you know, it's, it's trendy. It's so mental health has become trendy. We know that it's always been an issue, but now mental health is trendy because all the stars are saying mental health issues, et cetera. And so it's trendy to be a trendy therapist and to only take a certain type of clientele. And now with the shortage, therapists can do that. They can be very picky. Back in the day, we couldn't, we couldn't be picky. You, you just took the referral that came to you. Now I can be trendy and say, I only take, you know, people that are influencers from Instagram that are going to promote my business. So you, you have that coming into play as well. And then you have, I have therapists and I've seen a few people that say they don't want to do therapy anymore because also on the other side of that, our society has become so sue happy. They, they don't want to get in, in the hairs of, I'm telling you that you shouldn't do this or my recommendation as a therapist that you should not do this. Now I'm suing you. And so I think that we're at this very critical tipping point um, with therapy and, and, and providing care where you can work can go on either side. And so it helps lend to the to the shortage and, and ultimately patient care, which is the sad part about it. Well, I think which maybe rather the tell platforms. Yeah, tell health. I said, which might might be why there is space for these platforms. They're trying to absolutely. There's a need. People have a need. They want to talk mm -hmm. to somebody, and they can't get an appointment, or they can't find a therapist, or uh, they, you know, it's seven hundred dollars or whatever. Uh, and these they, they, these these platforms are stepping mm -hmm. in. <laughs> Totally. I do think it's a very multifaceted issue. And I will say, I'm not sure it's a parity issue because I, I know of several experiences where physical health providers are experiencing a shortage too. So I think the shortages are occurring kind of everywhere you look in healthcare. But I do think, um, you know, some of the dialogue that folks were taking or that folks were talking about is right now, it's very easy for anybody, non licensed, licensed, to hang a shingle out of their window, call themselves a you know, a therapist or life coach or whatever you want, and to take cash only. We're seeing significant increases in that and in that practice, and it definitely doesn't help kind of get people into, you know, the the insurance space where we have, you know, the right network for folks. I think, I mean, I know that working with Access and with many of the health plans, there's a lot of strategies really around workforce development starting with colleges, starting with high schools. I mean, so it's, I, we have, we have to have a short-term plan. ARPA, you know, is a big part of that. And a long-term plan that I think really involves um, education and starting to get folks interested in serving um, populations in a, you know, in a therapeutic way. So I think there's, I, I think
think it's an incredibly complex issue, and I think we, we had semblances of these issues pre-COVID, and COVID just brought it to this, you know, entirely different place that I don't think anyone would have ever had the foresight to even be able to predict. And so it's definitely working from a health plan perspective. It is, um, it, like I said, this is something that we work on every single day. And it's definitely, I love that we're having the conversation because when you think about just healthcare in general, um, this is the conversations that I think need to happen to increase awareness and to just even bring uh, where, or just to even be able to start talking about what are some of the ideas and what are some of the initiatives that are happening out there because at some point it's it's the community, it's the state, it's all of us, um, and it's nationally as well that have to kind of come together to figure out how do we make sure that people, kids and families alike, and all of us have the health care they need when they need it. And so it's, um, it's a much larger conversation and I'm just excited to, again, that the conversations are occurring. Yeah. Well, and, and I can appreciate what you're saying about that it happens on the medical side, but I do think that there is strong evidence to suggest that it is much more prevalent on the mental and behavioral health side, the, the access to in-network providers. Milliman has tons of data on this. Um, so, and, and, you know, obviously these stories that I have are anecdotal, but like I have a son who had a lot of very complex medical, like minor issues, but needed to see a number of different specialists <clears throat> in his first two years of life. Um, and I don't know, maybe my insurance plan is just gangbusters compared to the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> but I really just never had a hard time finding the a, a medical provider for him. But personally, finding a therapist was hard um, that was covered that anybody could vouch for. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a point well taken, but I still believe strongly that there is more going on under the surface when it comes to the mental and behavioral health side of things. And I love that we're having such a robust discussion. <laughs> But we are over our time and we definitely are. want to be mindful. But I will put some of these topics on for, for next time so we can discuss because there is an intersection there with parity at some level. We just haven't seen it yet, but it, it probably is there. So um, next meeting is July 15th um, at the same time at noon. And I hope everyone, I thank everyone for their input today. It's been, I mean, we could probably go on for hours and hours and hours, but <laughs> it is Friday the 13th and I want everyone to enjoy the rest of their day and their weekend. So you too, Lynette. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll see you guys everybody. in a couple months. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.